and welcome back to the Nasty Metal Production Channel here at YouTube. And welcome to, of course, the second episode here for Judas Priest Week. First one was, of course, was my Apple of the Week spotlight, of spotlight video for their album Killing Machine. So, for the second one is, of course, is, well, again, another uh, topic, but definitely on the band Sound. Uh, of course, uh, th this will be definitely going through all the eras because Judas Priest is one band that never stuck with one sound. They always went with all some sort of... They always had a way of changing it up for each album. Definitely uh, starting with their debut album from 1974, Rock where, where uh, pretty much the sound of Rock Rolla was basically typical of the whole 70s uh, hard and heavy sound. Of course, a band such as maybe Black Sabbath or Led Zeppelin, at least, uh, maybe just like the second or first album, a third album from Led Zeppelin, or maybe to some extent, maybe uh, Deep Purple or Uriah Heep, or even other bands uh, from there, like maybe Thin Lizzy, just very, or Cream from like uh, 1969, just a bit of that sort of 70s hard rock sound. And uh, that album was very typical, but then, of course, on the album Sad Wings of Destiny, they definitely started moving away a little bit from that sort of sound, even though it was still somewhat intact, but again, the heavy sort of sound, the sound that they definitely would kind of pretty much create, uh, and pretty much, uh, in a way, just, just to create uh, for, like, a... Uh, uh, from uh, from their future albums to even uh, um, this just influencing even the whole new wave of British heavy metal movement was all being somewhat uh, coming in on the Sad Rings of Destiny album. Definitely songs being uh, Tyrant or Genocide or uh, Deceiver. Uh, I think maybe uh, Dreamer Deceiver, excuse me, one of those or Island of Domination, and of course the song The Ripper and. The, Victim of Changes, all for, from there. But then, of course, on Sin After Sin, still keeping a bit of that sound on Soundings of Destiny, but again, even more moving it forward. This time, bringing a more metallic uh, sort of edge with, of course, songs like Sinner or Raw Deal or Distant Aggressor or Let Us Pray, Call for the Priest. Uh, all uh, bringing in more of a bit of a heavier, meaner sound that definitely will come in on the album after it that would definitely pretty much uh, cre already create their sound anyways will basically be uh, same class. Right there is where Judas Priest in a way found their sound. Throughout the whole album was probably the first sound where there's less on that sort of 70s kind of ballads everything is all just straightforward. Um, I guess you could say just heavy metal hard rock but a lot of it is, is very just very metalized. It's very metallic. From the production and onwards to the songwriting, everything on there is basically all more metallic, all more uh, precise sounding in a way. Even from Halford's screams, everything is all completely perfected on that album. And then, of course, they just ran with that sound. Uh, I guess not entirely completely because Killing Machine, was, which came out the same year, of course, released in 1979. As, of course, Hellbent for Leather, they definitely start taking on a more commercial sound, which would definitely be the this, this sort of thing that they definitely would end up uh, progressing with with their 80s albums. Uh, and that, that's, of course, uh, that leads into British Steel. Of course, I'm not trying to leave out the live albums, you know, Unleashed in the East or in Japan, known as Priest in the East, but... Definitely, that album was the end of an era for sure, the live album, because that was the last for drummer Les Binks, who of course definitely had a way of adding a bit to the sound of like Stained Class, and of course uh, Killing Machine. Of course, it's again, uh, for Sin After Sin, let's not forget Simon Phillips, who also had a very similar sound to Les Binks with the whole double bass or double kick drum attack. But again, coming in to like British Steel, with uh, bringing in Dave Holland, the late Dave Holland. Um, definitely, kind of, while definitely more metallic this time, still kind of running 
a bit of that metallic edge that they kind of had that they brought in on stained class but not nearly as dark or sinister as it was on stained class but of course uh, one of the high points that kept the album at least being less commercially uh let's say poppy or so is with songs such as steeler or rapid fire and metal gods or grinder or just um uh, the Rage, maybe, of course, being one of them. Just, <laughs> just once, just some of those songs definitely kept that amp from being too commercially uh, poppy. But with songs such as United, Living After Midnight, and Breaking the Law, they definitely um, kind of were kind of showing more with with the sound that they were running with on like uh, Killing Machine, definitely with songs such as Off the Killing Machine that really had a bit of a commercial edge where like Take on the World or Evening Star or of course um, then again the Battle be, uh, Before the Dawn it definitely had a bit of a commercial vibe to it as well but at, at the same time did it really get any radio play I don't know I never lived that era and I never lived in Britain <laughs> so again uh, moving back uh, to the sound of British Steel again uh, with the next sound point of entry if it wasn't ever noted on like Killing Machine or British Steel that they were going with a more of a commercial sound and making more poppier sort of kind of uh, songwritings or just songs in general point of entry definitely even showed that more and uh, with songs such as You Say Yes or uh, All The Way or Turning Circles yeah they definitely were going with a much more of a poppy edge on that album. Definitely before uh, an album that we will definitely get to here on that album sound. But because of that, and because of what uh, the Judas Priest fan base kind of felt about Point of Entry, they surely came back with a much more of a heavier, more meaner sound that would definitely change up their sound once again. That's of course with Screaming for Vengeance. And boy, uh, did that album definitely, in a way, change the landscape for the whole heavy metal genre. If Stained Class, A Sin After Sin, and even Killing Machine kind of changed uh, the way for how what heavy metal was going to sound in the 1980s, especially with that whole new wave of British heavy metal movement and its bands, Screaming for Vengeance was definitely going to uh, lead led the way for other uh, heavy metal bands, maybe some of the thrash metal bands, the speed metal bands. Then we were songs such as Screaming for Vengeance, or uh, uh, Hellion, Riding on the Wind, uh, just really showed that this band was still had a way of really changing up the sound. Then we were even uh, talking about the whole U.S. power metal bands with like Obsession and so on. Like they all took took whatever Judas Priest was doing on Screaming for Vengeance and ran with it. Then of course we come to like Defense of the Faith and sure they started and uh, this sound start changing a little bit of the sound once again. But on that first side, such as Free Wheel Burning, Jawbreaker, The Sentinel, and of course on uh, side B with the songs such as Eat Me Alive, they surely kept, still I just kept that heavy sort of metal sound that they kind of somewhat brought in on Screen for Vengeance, that more metallic 80s sound that would definitely define 80s metal. They ran with it. But with songs such as Some Heads Are Gonna Roll, Love Bites, and um, Night Comes Down. They definitely were started sh uh, showing signs of what was going to be the next album. That's, of course, we then come to Turbo. Their first venture album really into 80s pop rock. And with its all sort of synthesizer uh, guitar sound and somewhat processed drum sounds and everything of that record, it definitely had them really moving more with the... I don't know if I want to say the hair metal bands, because a lot of the hair metal bands had a bit of a heavier edge at a time. It definitely, if you looked at bands like Rat, or uh, Motley Crue still at that time, or Dawkin, they didn't necessarily go as much as a sound. If anything, we are really going with a sound something like uh, Poi, uh, no, maybe like Bon Jovi. Uh, probably. <laughs> But still, it's like this was more pop than really even glam or hair metal. Everything about that album had a more of a poppy edge. Sir, they still had a way of bringing, uh, still showing signs of that, uh, what Priest definitely had on albums such as Smurf of Vengeance 
or the defenders of the faith or British Steel, it's maybe a song like Out in the Cold, probably be one of the most obvious choices. Sure, with the synth intro, but the man the song goes in, yeah, it's it has a bit of a heavy song. It's probably one of my favorite songs off the Turbo album. But because of that and how that album divided with, of course, an album such as Point of Entry, again, going back, that one was the first one that really shows signs of them going or trying to experiment with that pop edge, but really moving it forward with their third album in, in the 1980s with Turbo. It definitely divided the fans once again. So the album after, they fall up with Ram It Down. And while half that album actually, or force of that album actually was apparently recorded during the Turbo Sessions because uh, if you ever look at the background or ever ever uh, searched or read about it, Turbo was supposed to have been a double album. It was supposed to be called Twin Turbos. And it had and some of the songs that were used like the bonus tracks of the remastered such as Prison of Your Eyes, uh, Turn On The Lights, or... Um, Fuck, I came. Uh, red, white, and blue. And um, just some of those snacks, uh, songs, actually, not snacks, songs. <laughs> uh, we can't go off track for at least uh, during a somewhat of a serious topic. Anyways, uh, they definitely, uh, some of those songs were apparently were recorded also during that and were supposed to, uh, were you supposed to have been used for that idea of Twin Turbos of being having Turbo as a double album. But because of that, especially some of the, uh, for the song not for Ram It Down being the song Ram It Down, uh, Love You To Death, uh, no, not, um, uh, definitely not uh, Love Love Zone. Wow, I can't even speak anyways. Uh, not Love Zone though. Yeah, sure, that song sounded kind of like it should have been Turbo, but apparently it wasn't recorded for the Twin Turbos album. It wasn't. It wasn't even recorded during those sessions. So, uh, that, Heart as Iron, and Monsters of Rock were, super, were apparently, supposedly, the songs that were recorded during the Turbo Sessions and were supposed to have been used for that idea of Twin Turbos. So, with all of that and with the songs already recorded for Turbo, it was supposed to make it a double album because uh, since Columbia Records thought it was a bit too of a risky idea. Like, it wasn't risky for Judas Priest to go for a fucking pop direction and basically divide the whole fan base. Uh, that, like, this one wasn't going to be any different. Uh, of course, listening to, to what that album was originally was supposed to have been, it actually would have been a much better album than actually what we had gotten. So, what, what was the fucking difference? Anyways, uh, with that... They used some of the songs that were re recorded, you know, songs such as Ram It Down, um, uh, of course, uh, Monsters of Rock, Heart as Iron, and Love You to Death. Those ended up being record uh, used along with the newer recordings, such as Love Zone, um, Blood Red Skies, uh, I'm a Rocker, uh... I'm trying to think as much without going for my copy of Ram It Down. Uh, I know their, their cover of the most embarrassing cover song that Judas Priest ever did, which of course being uh, Chuck, the late Chuck Berry's um, fucking <laughs> uh, Johnny Be Good. Uh, and of course so there's a fifth one there that I'm also kind of forgetting about. Um... Ah, Come and Get It. Those songs, with those, and even, of course, uh, the songs Fire Burns Below and even Thunder Road were recorded during the Ram It Down sentence, but were never used. I would have happy, gladly, to have had Thunder Road instead of Johnny Be Good for Ram It Down. But still, with those five songs that were chosen, along with the four songs that were already supposedly recorded with Twin Turbos, they definitely used it and released it as Ram It Down in 1988, and that album definitely was a somewhat of a departure. It was a transitional album from the more poppy, some of the processed sound of Turbo to the more heavy edge that we're going to get on the album after. And of course, Ram It Down served as an end of an era album for both drummer, the late drummer Dave Holland, and of course, well, producer, uh, well... Uh, yeah, Tom Allen. 
But it wasn't the end of an era album because we'll get to that. We'll get to that. Uh, this video is going to be somewhat long. Uh, that's why it's probably being uploaded a day later. Not on the day that this is being recorded. Anyways, with that, there am, uh, while Ram It Down definitely showed, was a transition lamp, and again, it showed where the band was heading, which was the heavier direction. And that brings us to Painkiller, which is definitely considered one of the band's masterpieces. Since maybe some of their 70s material with like Stained Glass, or Sin After Sin, or Sad Wings of Destiny, this was definitely uh, one of the, considered one of the greatest albums ever made when it comes to definitely heavy metal in general. This sound definitely had a heavier direction. Judas Priest saw themselves going for the more of the sound that a lot of the U uh, European power metal bands are going for, or even the U.S. with some of those U.S. power metal bands, even though their albums such as uh, some of the heavy moments of like British Steel or Scream for Vengeance definitely kind of showed or really were used as kind of the influences for those bands. They took some of those bands and uh, those sounds, what they ran with the stuff off those albums, and basically, uh, well, they stuck with that sound of Pink on to, to this day. They still are going with the more of a heavier sound. However, that doesn't stop me from ever bringing up the uh, the fact that Painkiller, because it was released at the time that Judas Priest was slapped at the lawsuit over the Stained Class album being uh, what happened up in Reno, which I'm not too far away from, uh, which, of course, uh, involves the two teens that uh, tried to commit suicide over the song Better By You, Better Than Me, over the subliminal messages of what the fucking evangelical Christians were all warning us about. Oh, what they're going to cause us to do if we kept uh, listening to them. Yeah, that proved out to be nothing but bullshit. And Judas Priest won that case, and there is a doc... Uh, the DVD release, there is a DVD release of the whole... Uh, court case, and you can see why uh, Judas Priest won that case. So I don't have to uh, reiterate it. But because of that, Painkiller at the time served, just like, uh, well, with Time It Down served as the last, what did at that time serve as the last sound for producer Tom Allum, but again, for Painkiller, at the time it served as the last sound for, well, Rob Halford. Rob Halford went on to uh, form other uh, count, uh, countless bands, in a way, uh, Fight, playing more uh, Pantera-esque groove metal, though with a bit of a thrashy edge and a bit of that sound off of Painkiller mixed in, and of course even starting an industrial band called Two, and of course in the 2000s starting Halford. But Judas Priest they didn't stop them. They still they found a replacement singer for uh, Rob Halford, I'm forgetting to mention that, of course, Painkiller served as his debut for, and still to this day, drummer uh, Scott Travis. But, again, they found the replacement for Rob Halford, and that, of course, was Judas Priest uh, tribute singer uh, Tim Ripper Owens. And, of course, that leads us to the album Jugulator, which was dropped in 1997, and to people... That was a bit of a different sound. Even though they definitely kind of progressed with a bit of the heaviness of Painkiller, just like with Halford's fight, they also went for that same direction, which was kind of mixing power, uh, Pantera's uh, Cowboys from Hell, and uh, even to some extent, even kind of mixing a bit of the heavier albums that Anvil will kind of release at the time, you know, uh, absolutely no alternative or speed of sound uh, for that matter. Those, of course, I, uh, I can't say that uh, Judas Priest ever listened to those sounds because Absolute uh, No Alternative was released on the same year as uh, Jugulator. But again, it all had a similar heavy sound, just that groove metal sound. They kind of were going with that a bit. And... Um, they were kind of going with that sound a bit, so it was a bit of that uh, mixing of that sort of thrashy, uh, groove metal sound. Uh, to people, it's, again, it's somewhat divided because of the way it sounded. However, if that album showed any sort of dividing or any sort of uh, sound that was un Judas Priest, went to the next sound, which, of course, was Demolition, which served as the very last album for, of course, singer Tim Ripper Owens. 
Tim Harper Owens, of course, uh, left after this. Sam, or, I, I don't know, I think he just left. But Demolition was definitely a different sound, of course, for Judas Priest. If the Jugulator definitely was a different sound, but Demolition kind of saw them bring more of a sound, I think, acting more like Marilyn Manson than uh, anything Pantera. So it was a completely different sound, and I would say probably the weaker of the Tim Ripper Owens albums. I just kind of felt that Jugulator had more of a faster, more of a heavier edge, and it definitely felt uh, like a pretty good progression from, like, Painkiller. But Demolition was a whole different sound in a way. It's like there was barely any speed songs, maybe like Machine Man, but other than that, not all of it just stayed in one monotone uh, direction. It never went anywhere, it just stayed in one zone, and that's why I kind of can't get in that much of that out. Sure, it's not because of the whole fucking, um, uh, the whole industrial sound. They already kind of showing a little bit of that on the, uh, Jugulator album, but I think was somewhat used to its advantage than on here. Everything's all in your face with that sort of industrial sound. And I like some industrial metal, but at the same time, I don't think I care as much for Judas Priest's take on it. Just like, but at least it's not nearly on the goofy as hell side as what Morbid Angel did with the Lou Divinium Sanus. Jesus Christ, that's how. Uh, where you not supposed to take the industrial metal. It's like, that's on, like, full retard. <laughs> Still, Demolition served as the last sound for Tim Ripper Owens, but do not waste any time or do not crap your pants any longer or panic. Rob Halford eventually did come back, and they released a DVD at the time, uh, which was actually uh, called Electric Eye, but it was a compilation of both the Feel for Life uh, concert and a couple of music videos, I mean, including some videos from the 70s era. So it was, but then that leads us to the um, Angel Retribution, which was the comeback album for Rob Halford with Judas Priest. And again, uh, since then, Rob Halford stuck with them. However, that brings us to now the album Nostradamus. Once again, Nost uh, this band, uh, like again, the whole theme is the whole sound of Judas Priest. Judas Priest on Nostradamus, once again, someone went for a different sound. They went again, they went and tried with the whole double album thing. They failed to try and do it with the Twin Turbos idea because Columbia rejecting that idea. But they still wanted to do a double album, and they did with Nostradamus. But it wasn't anything what they originally wanted to do with Twin Turbos. Instead, they wanted to do something else different. That's basically almost go for like a progressive rock slash metal sound. Uh, since at the time, there was a lot of progressive uh, rock bands, and many people were kind of getting into that whole progressive metal sound with bands such as Dream Theater or Fate's Warning. Just or uh, just some of those bands uh, uh, to definitely name a few. They wanted to go for that sound and and do a concept album. On uh, since at the time of 2008, people were all still talking about uh, the whole end of the world and how they found the book of Nostradamus and how Nostradamus predicted uh, the end of the world and everything about oh, 2012. Oh my God, yeah. Yeah, I know. Uh, in a way, Jesus Priest kind of wanted to address some of that with the whole concept of Nostradamus. So, uh, now, the album itself, it's definitely not a bad album. They definitely want in a way, it kind of had them going back a little bit to the 70s edge. Now, again, uh, Judas Priest at one point did kind of uh, had a bit of a... A progressive sound, especially on the first three Juice Priest albums, Rockerola, Sounds of Destiny, and Sin After Sin. And of course, if um, Judas Priest ran with that sort of progressive idea of like those three albums, they would have been considered more of a progressive uh, rock or progressive metal band. But because of them doing Stained Class, it moved them out from that. But they tried to somewhat go back a bit of that 
But of course, adding a bit of their uh, all the various different sounds from the 90s to then the 2000s, of course, with Nostradamus. So it was like a mixture of everything. But the concept thing and everything, it kind of made people again divided. It's like, what are they trying to do? They're trying to go Iron Maiden on the snail? Oh my god. Um, of course, once again, it was me the last time they ever did decide to go for a bit of a conceptual progressive album. Uh, but again, Nostradamus once again served as an album for another member to leave. It was an end of an era album for K.K. Downing, who, of course, after this album, uh, would leave, of course, during their Epitaph tour, um, which, of course, K.K. Downing retired. Um, do not have me go into to the whole situation um, when I get, get to uh, their newest album. Don't. I may have to do a video on that in general. So, with that... Uh, new guitar player Richie Faulkner, who have played with bands such as Deeds and um, Sean Harris's daughter, um, of which I, I you know what forget it. I can't remember her name other than it's Sean Harris's daughter, and um, I'm not gonna go on my smartphone. Anyways, uh, during the Epitaph tour, Richie Faulkner comes in. Tour ends. They record another album, and that's her, and would be the debut. For new guitar player Richie Faulkner, and that's of course was Redeemer of Souls, and this sound definitely, um, well, it definitely did not as much divide as that. They definitely still somewhat had a bit of the sound from like Angel Retribution, or even like uh, Nostradamus. Like they still some of that had uh, that sound was still somewhat, but they definitely were going back to the straightforward metal sound of. Angel Retribution and Painkiller and well maybe backwards. Still, it was a bit of a different album in a way because people felt that Richie Faulkner didn't nearly fit the sound, but I think he fits the sound. Of course, why? Why wouldn't he? He's a replacement guitar player. He's not what you want him to sound like. KK Downing. He's not KK Downing. So why even make that sort of argument? Uh, anyways, still, uh, we, we, we complain about when, how many times they had to change their drummers. It's like, oh, geez, they should have still kept at this. And sure, we all said that, but at the same time, we don't act, we didn't act nearly as much as we did with, like, uh, here we are with Richie Faulkner, so what the fuck? Anyways, this sound, of course, uh, well, was a debut. For um, production wise, eh. But Sam Wise was all right. Seeing Judas Priest on this tour, seeing uh, Ju for them the first time, and uh, I, w I had many chances to see him when KK was in the pan, but just never did. So seeing him with Richie Faulkner, it's like, hey, it's a nice, um, nice thing here. Uh, Richie Faulkner definitely put on a great performance. Uh, him and Glenn Tipton definitely, I think. I don't know if you could say they had great chemistry, but they had at least good enough chemistry, at least. It's like, hey, go on with the, uh, the show must go on. So now that leaves us to, well, the new album here, Firepower, which of course gets dropped on March 9th. Now, of course, once again, from what I've heard, yeah, again, it's definitely better produced, bringing in uh, um, Andy Sneap. However, this album is the return of producer Tom Malum, who left after Ram It Down. So, that, however, this might be the last sound, though, for Judas Priest, and, of course, this seems to be the last sound, definitely for guitar player Glenn Tipton, of course, ended up getting diagnosed with Parkinson's disease. So, it definitely has you wondering, is this going to be the last Judas Priest sound? As far as the sound, again, it follows where um, Redeemer Souls left off, but kind of progressive back to, like, Angel Retribution since... Uh, with this production side. So, with that, what can else be said? I have yet to listen to the album yet. I only heard some snippets and everything. I'll definitely will be reviewing it for sure. So, with that, we looked through all the di various different sounds from their 70s to the 80s to the 90s to then the 2000s and to the 2010s and now. But, 
will I ever do a future on their sound if they ever decide to change it again? If they continue, if they keep continuing, the future holds after firepower. So, hope you endured yourself throughout this long-winded video. Uh, definitely uh, give me your thoughts on what you actually uh, thought of the whole eras and different sounds of Judas Priest and what you thought if Judas Priest should have been kept changing the sound. It, bands progress. So the minute the times move along, the more the bands have to move along. It's something unless you're ACDC or you're maybe Accept or you're Motorhead or you're Anvil. It really doesn't matter in that sort of um, aspect. So, definitely uh, let me know what you think of this. Anyways, uh, until then, they have this fresh shit. Sam out. I'll see you again here shortly within Judas Priest Week. Uh, about a week long. Take care.